So where do you feel folklore husbandry came from and, and, and how did it take hold in the hobby so strongly? I think that folklore husbandry, it, it's, it's a product of, of human nature. So where did the motivation come from to create this paper? Because when we look at your work scientifically, like we were saying before, it's a lot of crayfish, it's e ecology work, and it almost seems like you are a dedicated uh, hobbyist who took the advantage of the fact that you're a scientist to write an excellent paper to help us out. I'm not sure if that's yeah. accurate or not, but you can kind of take it from there. No, that's... That's fairly accurate. You were listening to episode number, what are we on? Episode number 73 of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin. Thank you very much for joining me today. This is the final episode of 2020. We got through the whole year, guys. Thank you very much for sticking with uh, the year, but also the show as well. I know many of you guys have been listening from day one, and we've picked up many new listeners along the way. So thank you to all of you. I really appreciate it. As I said last week, we're probably going to take a gap, probably maybe one or two weeks. So this will be the last episode for this year, obviously, and I'll probably fire back up in the middle of January at some point. So if there is a gap or two, don't panic. It's just me taking a little bit of time off during the holidays here, and we'll get back to normal scheduled programming after that. A couple of quick things. Yesterday, as I'm recording this intro, yesterday, probably about a week ago for you, if you're listening to this when I post it, I did an episode of Triple B TV with Brian Cusco, which is a really great conversation, of course. You know, I don't collide with the morph breeding sort of rack style keeping care or, or keepers very often. And I did in this case, and we had a great conversation about, you know, moving the hobby forward. What are some ways that we can all work together? Because at the end of the day, we are all reptile keepers. And I really wanted to make that message clear that I'm not against them or hate them. I want to actually combine and collaborate with those keepers to see if we can all push this hobby forward together. And it was honestly such a great conversation. Without a doubt, I'll be doing something with Brian again in the future, and we're going to stay connected. So I, I do really encourage you to go take a look at that and uh, then you get to see you know hear me talk a little bit more of course on the podcast it's mostly my guests so hopefully that is something you are interested in and as always if you're looking for more information on the podcast make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com you can find links to all the shows as with different episodes and show notes there and if you do want to pick yourself up an animals at home t-shirt or sweater you can do that at animalsathome.ca slash shop five dollars is automatically donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy with every shirt sold. And again, we're almost at the $600 point with donations. So that is something I'm super excited about. Thank you very much to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. If you're looking for more information on them, check out the show notes or the YouTube description box. Again, those are affiliate links. So if you do purchase something through those links, I do get a small commission at no extra cost to you, which of course supports the show. And if you are looking for other ways to support the show, you can give us a rating on the Apple podcasting app or write a review or just share the content. That's really the best way. Let's try to grow this listener base and grow this community. You guys have already done an amazing job at that at sharing the content. And let's just keep doing that so we can continue to grow this community and culture that we have been building over the last year or so. All right, let's jump into today's episode. So today I'm speaking with Professor Zach Lofman out of West Liberty University. The conversation mainly revolves around a paper that he just recently published in November titled Utilization of Natural History Information in Evidence-Based Herpticulture. So essentially, this paper lays out a very solid framework for how we can use natural history information about a species and combine that with husbandry attributes to create an evidence-based herpticulture protocol. Of course, you are well aware that folklore husbandry is something that has deep roots in the hobby. And we discuss where folklore husbandry came from, how did, how did it get started, and why does it have such a strong hold in the hobby? And then how does this framework actually help erase some of those myths and folklore husbandry that, that are still here today? And also we discuss how we can start to bridge that gap between the scientific and academic world and the hobby world, which I think is a really important bridge to gap, especially if we want to keep this hobby healthy and thriving and also justify its existence. The more we can connect those two worlds, the better. So I'm not going to say anything more. Let's just jump right into this conversation and I will see you guys in the outro. Enjoy. Well, Zach, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for doing this. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. You sent me a paper that you published earlier last month, and we're going to get into that because it's incredibly detailed, uh, in, very interesting using natural history to develop you know, husbandry protocols, which is sort of right up the alley of the podcast. And we're going to break that down in a little bit. But first, maybe you could just give us a little background of your education, sort of what you're doing now for, for a research role or an educating role. Yeah, so uh, I'm a professor. I actually wear a lot of hats at the university I'm at. So I'm at a little liberal arts school in northern West Virginia. We're actually closer to Pittsburgh than the bulk of West Virginia uh, in Pennsylvania. And um, I, here at this uh, university where I actually went to school for my undergrad, um, 
I am a biology professor, and I'm the guy that's in charge of or oversees all the organismal and ecology-based uh, majors in our biology program. And along those lines, I am in charge of the, wearing my uh, gear here, the zoo science program, which is a new program. We'll talk about that here in a minute. And um, that's our animal husbandry and conservation uh, major, one of three that we have here at the school. And then the other thing I do, that's primarily undergraduate, but um, in 2017, we started a graduate program in biology, which is pretty awesome. So uh, I'm the co-biology program coordinator for the graduate program. And my responsibility there, again, is to be in charge of our zoo science master's degree program and our ecology program. And on top of all that, you can see the crayfish behind me. Uh, that's what really pays the bills here. I'm a crayfish biologist um, and I have a very active field-based uh, conservation lab that focuses on freshwater crayfish. And then obviously I do all the herpetoculture stuff. So I'm one of the very few people you ever meet uh, that's masochistic enough to have <laughs> two research labs rolling at once that really don't have anything to do with each other. <laughs> what is wrong with you? Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I ask that question to myself often, but the herpetoculture lab, and it's it, it just started officially this summer when I realized like I have five graduate students that are doing thesis theses in herpetoculture, whether I want to admit it or not, that's a research lab. So um, basically result of the paper we're going to talk about today, I have the, the, the lab that's kind of the focus for the podcast, which is the evidence-based herpetoculture lab at West Liberty University. So so then where did reptiles come into your life? Was this something that was a childhood passion that you've now folded into work? Because obviously you're saying your main work or is crayfish studies, so you didn't go ahead with that individually until now where you have students doing it. So where did the reptiles yeah. come in? R reptiles have been ever-present. Mm -hmm. um, I'm that weird individual that there was never a point in life when I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, when I was little, um, I... I Basically, the creepy crawlies of the world have always been my favorites. Uh, and I don't say that in a negative way. I actually use that as a term of endearment. Um, and so my my early childhood, I, I had a the, the obligatory dinosaur phase and was a dinosaur nut. But it wasn't just dinosaurs. It was anything that had scales. So it definitely blurred into reptiles and amphibians. Mm -hmm. And then it was about in third grade uh, when I was nine or ten where it's kind of that classic story. I couldn't find a dinosaur to grant it back then we didn't know birds were essentially dinosaurs. So we won't go down that tangent, but, uh, I wanted things with scales and I started to bumble into garter snakes and, you know, my grandfather found a box turtle crossing the road. And even though we tell people not to do this today, this was the eighties and he threw it in the trunk of his car. And that was actually my first reptile pet. And I had that in second grade. And really there hasn't been a time since second grade. I haven't been in charge of at least, taking care of one reptile uh, in my life. So reptiles have been ever present. And I actually went to all through high school, undergrad, and even my first graduate degree, my master's degree, herpetology was, you know, that was the focus. Um, and it still is today. It was just when I was getting my master's in herpetology, that was right when Steve Irwin was at his peak and Jeff Corwin was at his peak and Park O'Shea was there. And everybody in your mother was focused on getting jobs in herpetology. And I had a a moment with my advisor and my advisor basically said like, listen, the reptiles and amphibians are always going to be there. I've watched you pick an animal group that very few people focus on and then, you know, focus on it and be one of the guys or the guy. And then you will never have to worry about getting a job or having funding or anything like that. And it was absolutely without question, the best advice I've been given, mm. but that doesn't mean that I just flipped a switch and turned off herpetology. So it, it's kind of always been there. And with the advent of our zoo side degree, it's been wonderful that I get to, you know, do a head first dive back into it. So. And then as far as what you have at home right now, you have a few animal of the reptiles at <laughs> home in your home collection. What do you have? Uh, well, it's, it's kind of weird because given the nature of our university and the whole fact that one of my tasks with this major was to build an animal collection which sounds like that, a dream <laughs> it is literally a dream if if you would have told my 20 year old self that i was going to get paid to do this because yeah. that's when the herps were like you know the main focus i would have literally looked at you and been like there's no way um 
but in building that collection, we needed to run quarantine. So some of the animals would like temporarily go to my house um, and be taken care of there. The nature of our collection is such that we have students interacting with the animals. When the animals start to get too stressed out, um, and I don't want to give the impression that they're all stressed out, but like case studies here and there, they need to go to a place where it's much more focused and, and, and fewer people. So they'll go to my house. So there's kind of a blurring between the university collection and my collection with that. But my personal collection at the school, or sorry, at the at my house, is composed of somewhere between forty and sixty snakes and a handful of lizards. So, and the bulk of my collection is, ironically, what's here at the university because I'm the guy that designed the collection here. Uh, so, um, as we'll soon find out, false water cobras are my absolute favorite snake on planet Earth. So, I have quite a few of those at the house. A uh, bunch of opisthoglyphus snakes. Um, a bunch of location boas, uh, I have at the house, short-tailed pythons, um, and then, uh, rat snakes, and then, a, a handful of, uh, crested geckos of all things. I really like them as well. So yeah, hey, nothing that's what's at the house. Mm -hmm. so, so before we jump into the paper, I want to know where, where did the obsession with false water cobras come from? Because they're kind of involved in the paper obviously as well, but they're, they're almost an unusual passion because you don't see them you're starting yeah. to see them more and now but they're they weren't very common even 10 years ago yeah so when i was in initially indoctrinated into herpetoculture uh that was the late 90s early 2000s and right when i kind of left because graduate school and i was building my family and all that kind of stuff which was around 2003 2004 but up to that point i don't want to say that there wasn't a focus on breeding but the main focus was on keeping and that was in the years where people would have kind of eclectic collections where you would have like one of this, one of that, one of this, and, and they might all be related, whatever this may be, but you know, it wasn't this, I'm going to have, you know, 5.5 of whatever and breed them and, and go like that. And the way I like to keep at a personal level is I really drive all my decision-making process of off of what I'm going to maintain in a personal collection based entirely off of me geeking out over the biology and ecology of the animal in question. And I have all, and keep in mind, like I went the academic route with herpetology in addition to herpetoculture. And what I learned very early on is that I really like semi-aquatic snakes. I don't know why, but I've always been intrigued by snakes that have a terrestrial existence and an aquatic existence. And when I was in college, uh, my first real research project involved the northern or common water snake, Nerodia sipidon, sipidon. And I basically just did what's called an odd ecology study and found a local population. Uh, my advisor gave me some minnow traps, um, some uh, you know measuring equipment, and I just went out and studied everything there was about it. And in doing so, that furthered my love for these aquatic snakes. So when we got the zoo science major here at the university. I knew that I had to pick an animal that I that would hold my interest, um, and that I could actually make some inroads with the husbandry. Because since this is an academic program, one of the things we've got to do is write papers and publish. And so I was looking for a semi-aquatic snake that had a history in herpetoculture, but really wasn't being worked with that much. And I worked a little bit, you know, with Nerodia, and I worked a little bit with some of the Asiatic and South American water snakes. And I kind of stumbled into Hydrodynasties, uh, the false water cobras one night on my couch. I knew they existed. And what I knew up to that point was that they got really big. They had a reputation for being aggressive and that they had this venom that was equal to a timber rattlesnake. And so bringing those into a university with <laughs> undergrads, probably not the smartest idea. Uh, so I did what I always do, which is I, I, you know, thought, well, maybe this will be the snake. And I, I started reading everything I could online, um, both academically and from the hobby perspective. Uh, and, and I found a couple Facebook groups on water cobras. And what was really kind of intriguing about those groups is they were the anti herp Facebook groups and that everybody on there was like polite. They were encouraging. What? There were, <laughs> yeah, there were questions that were being asked a million times and that people weren't getting flamed. So, and what was interesting is what was on those groups was very different than what was on uh, the internet. So it created this dynamic where we're like, well, which is true is what's on the group, the way you keep them, or is what's on the internet, the way you keep them. 
And so I kind of realized I got to go somewhere and figure out which is, which is the truth here. If I'm going to even entertain the idea of doing this. And then that's what led me to reading a bunch about their biology. Cause I thought if I can look at what's been written about them in the field, I could maybe extrapolate some of what's been observed in the field to these two dichotomous ways of keeping and figure out which one way is white or right. And that's what kind of led to the genesis of the paper in the first place. And then in doing that, I, I really was interested in like figuring out, are they really as venomous as a timber rattlesnake? And I, I found a great paper that was a bite history, a case study, and it dove into the biochemistry of their saliva. And it turns out that there's an element of truth to that. If you were to, if you were to make the venom gram for gram equal, yes. But when a timber rattlesnake bites you, it's injecting it directly into your muscle. When a false water cobra bites you, it's got to you know, work that secretion into you. It's not a really efficient venom delivery system. And what I found out was that basically they are dangerous. I don't want to paint a picture that they're not. They don't have the potential to cause a serious bite. But they're cert- if you're going to ask me to get bit between a timber rattlesnake and a false water cobra, I will be bit 100 times by a false water cobra before I even entertain the idea of it going down with a timber. Uh, and so I realized they may not be as quote unquote dangerous as, as uh, you know, put out there. And then in that, those two forums, people were mentioning how intelligent they were and they were reactive to the keeper. And I thought, well, one of the things I wanted to get into was snake behavior in human care. So I thought, well, here we have a large semi-aquatic snake that fits that bill for me. Um, there's some husbandry written, but there's still definite avenues we can work with. So that fills another bill. And then they appear to be a little bit more reactive in, in their behavior to a person. So it kind of fit three, you know, there's three boxes there I needed checked. So I went out and actually the first water cobra that we, I purchased was with, was for me, it was for my personal collection. And I knew within a week of having it, like, this is my snake, mm. uh, because it really was the perfect animal for the way I like to keep. So, wow. So that's great. So, so that you, you get the three check marks there. So that leads us perfectly into this, this study, this case study that you've just written because, and so what I wanted to ask was where that motivation came from, because I think as you're kind of already suggesting, you're running into some of that folklore husbandry and you know, that's a wall mm. that many of us hit. So where did the motivation come from to create this paper? Because when we look at your work scientifically, like we were saying before, it's a lot of crayfish, it's e- ecology work, and it almost seems like you are a dedicated a hobbyist who took the advantage of the fact that you're a scientist to write an excellent paper to help us out. I'm not sure if that's accurate yeah. or not, but you can kind of take it from there. No, that's, that's fairly accurate. Um, <laughs> so basically there, there's, there's many reasons, many independent events. That's the right word that kind of led me to, all right, I got to write a paper. Um, one of those is I actually teach, a, I teach two courses in herpetoculture here at the university. Uh, one is an undergraduate class that's the technical title for it is herpetology and herpetoculture. So in the, the lecture class, it's all evolutionary history, ecology, your classic herp class. But then the laboratory is 100% dedicated to herpetoculture because the goal is to get people into zoos, um, AZA accredited zoos. So with that course, there's actually a semester long project where I make my students pick a species and then they have to go out and purchase a aquarium and literally build a vivarium from the ground up following the biology of the animal that they're, they're working on, not necessarily care guides, but rather what they can find in the scientific literature. So I had that project and I knew I needed to like write something up for it. Um, because the students were saying like, this is a great project, but it needs more focus. So I had to like fill that void. And then to be honest with you, uh, I got the graduate students and with the graduate students, we now have five different thesis projects and I'm only going to get more in herpetoculture. So now I'm like a legitimate herpetoculturalist. Um, and I, I needed that to seem official, uh, for them and for me. And, and for recruiting purposes and funding purposes. And the way you do that is in academia, you write a paper uh, and, and you publish and you kind of show uh, the way that you are supporting the field of study. And so the, this budding lab needed something in the published literature to kind of represent it. Mm. And then the third thing was I, I, you know, I'm starved for content because most 
people with advanced degrees don't go into herpetoculture necessarily and write publications and, and things like that. And I've got to go and get that content somewhere. And that's where your podcast is wonderful, by the way. Thank you. Um, other podcasts and, and uh, different, it, it's, it's been really weird for me to kind of seek out content and then go to social media as an academic because I think <laughs> yeah. that's not what we're trained yeah to you do. said on www.facebook.com something's wrong yeah. there <laughs> yeah so i don't want to give the impression like that's the only place i go but if i want to get a nugget here or a nugget there i will go there and and sites like advancing herpetological husbandry are wonderful mm -hmm. uh resources for that so um but when i go there I, I could see the elements of what's in the paper and I don't want to give the impression that I'm the guy that came up with this per se, because I'm not. People have been using natural history information forever. But what I realized was what was missing was like a formal framework that somebody that's kind of getting into this could go to and basically say, well, I want to use natural history information. How do I do that? Mm -hmm. And that's what I feel that's the void that the paper kind of fills. So what was actually happening is I was driving back and forth to work in April and I realized I'm not going to have a field season because of COVID uh, and the pandemic. And if there was ever a year for me to focus on herpetoculture, it was this year. And so I thought the best thing I could do with my break is put out that first publication. And so if I write the publication, I can fill the void on the um, class. I can give my students something to read. It kind of, it was needed, if you will, in my world. So I thought, what the heck? I'll give this thing a go. And then basically that's what kind of started it. And I didn't realize like, this is what I was doing. Uh, Cause when you read it, it seems like, Oh, well, Loafman started out thinking I'm going to develop a framework. In reality, I almost had to reverse engineer it and like, like look at what I was doing in the past hmm. to then create what you see in the publication. Yeah, that makes sense. I was gonna, I was wondering about that because you have <laughs> dates that go back to 2018, and I wasn't yeah. sure if this is something that you had an it was an inception two years ago, or if it's something that you've backtracked. So that makes sense. So before mm -hmm. we get into that framework, because I think it is exactly what you're saying, it's a perfect framework for teaching people how to use those resources. Let's dial back to, to talk about the history of folklore husbandry, because that's sort of the crux of of that's sort of the issue here is that we have yeah. these weird things floating, and I think you you hit the nail on the head in in the paper. You say a lot of this care comes from economy of space and time for the keepers, which is really the wrong framework to use when we're talking about husbandry. So where do you feel folklore husbandry came from and, and, and how did it take hold in the hobby so strongly? I think that folklore husbandry, it, it's, it's a product of, of human nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and basically, if you have a small collection of, of animals that you have the ability to, to essentially dote on for lack of a better word, you know, you, you don't have to worry about space constraints necessarily. Um, you're able to put a lot of attention into a few individuals. And, and that's the way historically back in the day, the majority of reptile keepers and amphibian keepers went about what they were doing. This whole idea of I've got to have 50 to be legitimate mm -hmm. didn't really exist back in the 70s and the 80s. At the same time, we have the herpetoculture pioneers that are you know, trying to figure out how to breed these animals or trying to establish them in human care. And whether we you know, want to admit it or not, those initial animals brought in from the wild, we're gonna have a lot of mortality. And so the way that you go about establishing them is you have to have numbers. And basically mm -hmm. you have to convert these animals from the wild, get past parasites, get past entrained behaviors, until the point that you get to that F1 generation from, from the breeding. So there was an initial reaction of, you know, I got to have the, the numbers. And if I got to have the numbers, I have a limited amount of space. So I've got to kind of hit this middle ground per se. And initially, if you look at the way people were keeping, and, I, and this is discussed in the introduction of the paper, there was still this naturalistic aspect to it. It may not be full blown naturalistic, but we might have a stick in there. We might have some substrate in there, some hides. And it's just, as people started figuring out this whole breeding thing, you need, you want to have more. So the next thing you know, you start to whittle away at the complexity of the enclosures and you're going to be searching out that bare minimum because that bare minimum leads immediately to an economy of space, which leads to you having more of them, which leads to this perception of success. And that's what was going on both in the private sector and in zoos, to be honest with you. 
um, in the, the, the 80, late 80s through the 90s. And, and by the time you get to the end of the 90s, uh, in the early 2000s, when things like ball pythons hit and the morph craze hits and people's incomes being based off this, obviously economy of space becomes super important because the more animals I have, the more eggs I can get, the more eggs I can get, the more money I can make. Uh, and then what was weird though, is that mentality kind of bled from breeders into just keepers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in doing so, when people would challenge this way of keeping, you would hear, well, that's just the way we've always done it. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously they're happy, they're breeding. If they're breeding, that equals contentment. Um, and that's not necessarily the case. I could speak from an evolutionary perspective. There's a large number of animals that when they get stressed, a response to stress is breeding mm -hmm. because basically it's a last ditch effort to maintain your population before it goes extinct. Yeah. So, and, and there's definite documentation with reptiles and amphibians of that happening. So breeding doesn't equal contentment if, if, if you will. So that mentality kind of hit uh, and it just kind of, it, 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 it took off. And so that, that kind of led to, to aspects of what we refer to as folklore husbandry. Yeah, and it's interesting, like, you know, you're saying those early days when we're trying to get those wild populations captively established here, obviously parasites being a big issue, illness being a big issue, cleanliness and, and sterilization would have been mm -hmm. very important as well. And then you have those setups, you know, eventually being successful, captively breeding, establishing a captive a population, and then the care itself remains as an artifact through almost. It's like yes. the sterilization wasn't, it, it was it, it was absolutely necessary to get that going, but it's not what is needed to continue, but it just carries on for infinite, it seems like. Yeah. And, and there's aspects of what we refer to as folklore husbandry that also kind of bleed into naturalistic keeping as well. It's not just... Mm -hmm. Um, the, the sterility, for instance, like, well, why do you put a heat lamp on that animal? Well, it needs to be hot. Well, what information do you have that, that shows it needs to be hot? And then a, a, an, an equally important question from a scientific perspective is what exactly constitutes hot? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you're a, a rachodactylid gecko from New Caledonia and your body temperature gets up into the 90s, low 100s, we know through trial and error and evidence that that is lethal. Uh, but with monitors, a great example is it was perceived that 100 degrees was hot enough for them. And so the reason for that is above 100 degrees, it's too hot for us. If you look at the way people were keeping monitors in the late 90s and the early 2000s, and they started to be really successful, they were setting up halogen lights and giving them the opportunity to get their body temperatures up into the um, 120 to even 140 degree range, which seems insane to us as mammals, but if you think about an animal out in Australia, it's not going to stay at that temperature forever. Mm -hmm. It's going to get to that temperature, it's operating body temp at that, and then it's going to basically start engaging the environment, and then that temperature will slowly drop down. There were people in the monitor world that when when this evidence came out and, and people were saying, you need to get them hotter, they were being pushed back with, well, no, that's, that's too hot. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we now know through evidence-based husbandry that they actually can get to be that way, and now... You know, that's dogma if you're keeping things like, you know, Aki monitors or, or, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is definitely interesting. Obviously, this is a science-based hobby, and we do want yes. to stay open to the evidence. We have to, or else we will be, you know, the welfare of our animals will suffer. So as far as the framework in the paper goes, it's roughly you have the natural history information from the animal, and you have this little formula, plus husbandry attributes equals your evidence-based herpticulture protocol. So maybe you could walk yep. through the framework and, and how you basically operated the study to get this framework. Sure. So, you know, I would... Love to give the impression that I, you know, sat here in this scholarly office with, you know, my pinkies out and just thought about how this is going to be. But that is not the way that this came to be. Um, the actual framework came up in the drive from my house to the office and then the drive from home back to the house. Uh, you know, that was when I kind of had my, my, my little moments of clarity. But what I, I realized was what was needed was this like, was not necessarily natural history information. People have used natural history information all the time. It was putting that natural history information that we love to use as herpetoculture people into an actual legitimate 
framework that enables us to do to kind of approach the husbandry of some animal we may not know that much about in an organized way to kind of hit all the biological needs of it. And so there were a series of papers that came out in the 80s and uh, the early 90s where basically the whole idea of natural history and natural history, I always tell my students, it's the who, what, when, where, why of an animal. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you might ask the question, well, where does it live? Well, to, that, that's a natural history question. Why does it use this microhabitat? That's a natural history question. Um, and unfortunately, natural history itself kind of went under attack in the 1970s and 80s because that's when the molecular biology boom hit. And when that boom hit, people started to question, well, is natural history even really science? Because it's not necessarily hypothesis-based. It's very observation-driven. Mm. Uh, all that aside, there were some papers in the 80s that kind of were, one, defending natural history, and two, defining it in a modern context. So I knew that the first thing I needed to do was simply define what these natural history questions were. And so this guy named Bartholomew wrote a really cool paper uh, in the mid 80s, and he basically came up with these questions of, you know, what a natural historian is trying to ask. And I've got the paper here. I would love to say that I can rattle them off the top of my head, but I can't. <laughs> uh, but those questions were, you know, what species is it? Where does the species live? How does the species survive? How did the species end up here? And, and you can think about like taking care of some reptile. If you can answer all those questions, you can certainly add that into the matrix of how to take care of it. And at the same time, there was uh, from the 60s on through today, this subset of ecology called life history biology. And, and that's where you're looking at like, when does an animal have its young? How many young does it have? Um, why does it have the number of young that it has? All of that immediately is applicable to captive breeding. Uh, and, and given, you know, that should be an aspect of the care of these animals. I thought, yeah, definitely have to make sure that that's included. So if we have those questions and we get the answers of those, we have to then frame the answer to those to the idea of husbandry. And so that's where uh, questions like what is needed for the captive environment? What are the physiological needs of the animal? What is needed to encourage natural behaviors? What are the welfare needs? And what is needed for captive breeding? Those all fall under herpetoculture. So if you nest the two together, the, bot, the end product is an evidence-based husbandry protocol. So basically came up with that idea driving from here to home and home to here. And then when I kind of came up with it, I thought, all right, now I got to go out and actually see if this is something that's worthy of investigating further. So when you thought of the idea on your commute, did you, were you already aware of the Bartholomew's questions that he had in natural history or did you end up going to find that after and it just worked out perfect? I was aware of Bartholomew's questions because I, uh, I'm, an, I'm an ardent defender of natural history in case you couldn't tell. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I had read the Bartholomew paper when I was in graduate school, um, mm -hmm. but it's been a while. So I did kind of go back and find it and you know revisit it. And when I was reading it, I was totally reading it with the idea of building this framework. And it, it, it definitely was like perfect. It was just absolutely spot on perfect for what I was trying to do. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, natural history is something that I do see get attacked a lot because I think it's because it is not as easy to show any of that in a lab necessarily. Like, I think sometimes science gets hung up on finding hard facts and testable facts when, when sometimes observation is actually a really good method of collecting data. Yeah. And what, what's kind of awesome about natural history is Within the past decade, and I don't want to give a uh, give everyone the impression like it's back completely in the limelight, but um, it is definitely it had a little bit of an absence as a major focus and pillar of biology in the late '90s through the early 2000s. And ecologists realized very quickly once that kind of foci was gone for a little while that like yeah, this is kind of like the bare bones basics needed for conservation biology and in, you know, the, the conservation process. If you don't know where an animal lives, how do you know what habitat to conserve? And the way that we kind of went about answering those questions for a little while was we were going to take the literature and we were going to make these models, mathematical models that were then going to tell us where the animal lives. And there was a, a subset of us biologists that were like, why don't we just go out and actually see where the animal lives? <laughs> just get a why do we ticket. have to like, yeah. <laughs> 
Why do we have to have this model if we can just go out and actually grab the data in situ? Yeah. Um, and what's kind of awesome is now, what's nice is the modelers and the natural historians are working together, which is the way it should have been from the very beginning. And when you use the models and you have people that are actually in the trenches of the field going out and gathering this information, it ends up being a beautiful system. And that's where, where we are today um, for some organismal groups, not all. And there's definitely more work to be, work to be done, but natural history is definitely making a, a comeback. Um, yeah, it's I guess, not there yet, but it's coming back. I guess the so. models probably help pinpoint you know, places where you need to go and where you're actually looking. And then it, you probably waste less time as a natural history yes. observer because you have like basically a map, a mark on that, you know, an X on the map. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I, I will totally admit I've used, we, I generate the models and I go out and validate the models for things like crayfish and now some herps for the record. Um, but I'm doing that always with my natural historian cap on. I'm not right. negating it. If the model tells me an animal should be here uh, and I drive to that location and it doesn't have the habitat that the animal needs i know before i go and even look for it it's probably not here um in the past there were some people that would say well no the model says it's there it, it's got to be there uh now we're kind of getting away from that so yeah well that makes sense there's always some nuance yes. in there so mm -hmm. the so now you've you've de de established this framework in your head and you started working on this paper then tell me about how you implemented it with the hydrodynasties because that was the species that you worked on yes. in the paper so <clears throat> You know, there was an element of reverse engineering with this whole thing, because basically I had kept my animals and generated my husbandry fact based off of this proposed protocol. Uh, I just didn't know I was doing it at the time. That's mm -hmm. the thing. So uh, what I basically do is I'm a note taking maniac. I was trained as an ecologist and a field biologist that if you're in the field, you, you write everything down. In fact, I'm in my office and, you know, right here is my data sheet for the water cobras that live in my office. So as soon as I got the water cobras and I realized that these were going to be my, my snake, if you will, I knew that I needed to get as much information on their husbandry as possible. So I basically started gathering everything I possibly could. So I weighed the animals bi-weekly. I noted every single thing that I fed them the day I fed them. I noted sheds, ovulations, uh, reactions to the season. When they went off food, I, came, I, I would note the barometric pressure and things like that. So basically treated them like they were animals out in the field. So I was doing that. And then here again, I had to generate that. I had to test the two ideas, if we go back to the beginning here, of what was being said in the, in the forum, uh, or sorry, the, the, the groups on water cobras, and then what was available to me online. And so the way that I went about challenging that is that I did what I was trained to do and went to the body of scientific literature. And I knew what key phrases were in journal article titles that I needed to search for to get the information that I needed. And one of the things that I knew I really needed was if anybody had just studied you know, every, a little bit of everything about a population of water cobras, that would show me activity levels during certain times of the year. That would show me what they ate. That would indicate what time of year, or what seasons they uh, lay eggs in. Usually with those life history studies, people will study museum specimens and dissect them and look at the reproductive tract and see when follicles are developing. Um, and also they would talk about, they would kind of estimate age at certain sizes. Just, and all of that is directly applicable to herpetoculture. So I did my literature search. And I was fortunate enough to find a paper uh, that absolutely did all of that. There were, there were two that were real important to me. Um, one was on the feeding ecology of water cobras. Uh, and it focused in, you know, on one population, but looked at water cobras across their distribution. And then another really good one, uh, Gerardo et al. was on, it was an odd ecology study, which is exact, which is studying everything. And that was in northeastern Argentina, and they studied water cobras all year long for multiple years. And so I was able to basically correlate, okay, the animal's peak activity on this graph is here. Then I used a weather website, looked up the closest city to their location, and was like, well, what's the temperature? Mm -hmm. And was able to deduce that in actuality, what the hobbyists were saying in the groups was 
far more accurate based off the science than these kind of all purpose generic care sheets that were present on the internet. And in reality, the, the, a lot of the keeping that I was finding uh, through the experience of these keepers wasn't that far off from what I was deducing from the natural history information. So I had done that process. I just didn't realize at the time that later on I was going to need it to write up a publication. So yeah, yeah. Well, and it's uh, you have some great tips for people for finding those journals and that information. Now, it, now, unfortunately, most I shouldn't say most, but several people don't have access to a university database where they might have access to journals and whatnot. But it, for the average person, do you have any recommendations for how they can find studies that might cover the species they're looking for? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, in actuality, given the nature of the World Wide Web today, um, if anybody still calls it that, uh, <laughs> there's this thing called Google Scholar. Uh, which, you know, there's people listening to this being like, of course, there's Google Scholar. But um, anybody has access to Google Scholar. Uh, all you literally do is open up Google and type in Google Scholar and then boom, it pops up. And if you put the key phrases that I talk about in my article into Google Scholar and then you fill in the void with the species name of the herp you're keeping, uh, you will – those search all the same – literary databases that universities have access to, uh, and you will get a return. The problem is actually getting your hands on the publication. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not going to, you know, flat out tell people how to do that. I'm simply going to say there are now ways <laughs> that you can get your hands on those journal articles where you don't necessarily have to be affiliated with a university to do so. Um, and one of those ways is, there's a wonderful site called ResearchGate, and ResearchGate is like social media for academics. And so when we publish papers, lots of active pub, um, authors will have a ResearchGate page. And if you can find them on ResearchGate page, their publications are right there. Mm -hmm. So in the case of the, uh, the um, feeding study that I was talking about, that's where I found it. I, I was able to, to find out that it existed through Google Scholar. I then took the title, put that into Google and searched it, and it popped up on the ResearchGate page. And then I went to the page, was able to download the PDF. And that didn't involve a university website at all. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of the, the uh, publication that was the ecology um, paper, I was able to go and find the main author. And I contacted him through ResearchGate and said, please, if you have a PDF of this paper, I would love to have a copy of it. And then he sent it to me. The problem was it was in Spanish. And mm -hmm. I can't speak that. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a big just, problem. <laughs> yeah. I just copied the whole thing and Google has a translator. So I dumped it into the translator and it didn't, I don't want to give the impression it translated 100%. I had to, you know, some of it was definitely broken English, but it absolutely translated enough for me to get the information that I needed. And so I was able to get these two papers just through the, you know, access that pretty much anybody has access to as long as they have the internet. Mm -hmm. And if I always say where there's a will, there's a way. If you scramble and ask questions and, and, and don't be afraid to reach out to the author, I can flat out tell you as the author of those papers, you know, we don't write these things for ourselves. We're writing this to get it out into the, you know, the world. So nine times out of 10, if you're able to get a hold of somebody and email them directly, be polite about it. Um, if they have easy access to the PDF, they'll just dump it in mm -hmm. uh, a response and send it out. And then, Open access papers. Uh, this paper is a great example of that. I, I purposely sought out a journal that I knew if I published the paper, anybody on planet Earth that had access to the internet could get it. So there's there's definitely ways to go about getting these these papers outside of a university. And yeah, those are fantastic tips. And some of those terms that you say in the paper to use, I think it's ecology of, there's a few yeah. other great ones. What, what are some other ones? Do you know them off the top of your head? Yes. So that was one of the things where my training as an ecologist w was was beneficial. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so classic natural history papers will oftentimes have key phrases in the titles that are, are present for if the if the research on a bird, a crayfish, a snake, a fish, or whatever, and then you basically have like this beginning to the phrase, and then you just fill in the blank with the species in question. And that was one of the parts that I realized a lot of herpetoculturists may not know. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they knew these key phrases and they knew to search for them, you might find 
a wonderful publication on the animal you're interested in. So for us as people maintaining reptiles in human care, one thing we're very interested in is just basically the environment where they live. So that's where you could type in, you know, distribution of, and then put in your species uh, or ecology of biology of those are going to be publications that take one population and really kind of dive into the nuts and bolts of its biology at that particular place. Those, in my opinion, are invaluable if you're going to be trying to come up with a care plan. If you're interested in diet, obviously, diet of, feeding biology of, um, those are some key phrases then put in your animal uh, that, are, that, that can be real important for you as well. And then the other thing that's real also important is well, we would love for taxonomy to be stagnant. Uh, the Latin names of these animals change all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's important that you know where to go to actually see, like, what's the, the history of the Latin name of this animal? Because it might be valuable to search an old genus species name versus the current species, you know, genus species name. And so where you can go to get that is there's a wonderful website called the Reptile Database. Uh, and it'll have what we as biologists call a, syn a synonymy or, or basically a list of synonyms, which are basically all the Latin names that have ever been used for this particular species. And so if you do a one of these searches using the most recent common or, or uh, sorry, Latin name, it, you may not get a hit. Whereas if you use the name that it had forever, you may get a hit. So a great example might be if you're interested in uh, the biology of North American rat snakes. Um, they were in the genus Alephae up until the early 2000s. So you might type ecology of Alephae obsoleta. That's the black rat snake. In 2003, four ish, that's when they got put into the genus Pantherophis. So you would also do the search for ecology of Pantherophis obsoletus or Pantherophis spoloides or Pantherophis alleghenians. Those are all rat mm -hmm. snakes now. So don't just do one search. Do you know, all searches with all names and then do one with the common name and you'll be surprised at what you can find. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's so true. And then the other website that I thought was great was the weatherspark.com, which is, I think, where you get most of your climate data from. Yes. Weatherspark. When I, when I stumbled into Weatherspark, I, th I, I questioned, you can hear me stuttering, like, why doesn't herpetoculture scream from the mountaintops that this website exists? I mean, it was <laughs> Because there's was, care sheets. <laughs> oh, it was wonderful because if you're able to find a location, mm -hmm. um, you can then find the nearest large city for your species in question. And then a lot of websites will give you the temperature data of a given location. Like that's easy. What WeatherSpark does is it gives you these beautifully you know, illustrated graphs for the whole calendar year. And you're able to really see like what's the seasonal change. Uh, in temperature, what's the seasonal change in relative humidity? And then there's other graphs in there. There's graphs like what what's the daylight cycle? Uh, what how rain levels? When does this place get inundated with rain? And when does this place become a localized desert? Uh, all that kind of really awesome climate data, which is directly 100% applicable to your care. So I found WeatherSpark. Um, back in the day. And I actually used it to generate my husbandry, you know, strategy for hydrogenastes and it ended up working out uh, really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the issue there is, well, how do I know where this animal lives? And obviously you can look for it, but there's websites where you can find that. So iNaturalist is a great example of that. You can type in the Latin name of an animal and through citizen science, people go out into the world. They, everybody can take pictures with their phone. So you take a picture with your phone, you upload it, into iNaturalist. And then when you do a search, up pops the picture. And now you have that location data. Uh, but you can also use museum collections. And that scares people. You know, you think that, you know, that's fancy. I got to have degree. You don't have to have degrees to do that. If you can do an internet search, you can search these. So there's a great one called VertNet. And you search for VertNet and it pops up. And you just simply put in the Latin name of your animal. And then what will end up happening is you'll get these distribution records back and you're able to see, okay, well, there's quite a few rainbow boas collected from this location in Brazil. So I can take that location in Brazil and make an assumption that this is a, a good area to base my husbandry technique for Epicrates off of. So I'm going to go to WeatherSpark now 
and do a search. And then I can get that information, which I can then use to drive my husbandry or question your husbandry. Because if you've been keeping things one way forever, mm -hmm. have you ever asked yourself, why am I doing it this way? So that's the evidence-based part to this. So, you know, if, if, if you're trying to answer, uh, if your animal goes off food or it seems stressed, you might have a climactic issue. You can go there and figure it out maybe. And I think it's a good exercise no matter what. If you've been keeping an animal successfully for a decade, mm -hmm. it, it'd be good to go through this and then just give yourself a little brush up. Like maybe there's some things I can change here because those care sheets that we have in the hobby are these step-by-step -step cookie cutter things that like you're saying are yes. often wrong. We end up caring for animals in the way that just happens to work, but it might not be right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And this challenges all of that. And then dare I say it, it's actually fun. Like, <laughs> yeah. If you are into this, you're probably, whether we want to admit it or not, a little bit of a geek and a nerd. And this is the way that you can really geek out on the care of your animal. And I have found it to be, you know, it, it is far more rewarding, in my opinion, if you are, if as a keeper, if you know all the biology, you know all the kind of ecology of this animal, what it's actually doing out in nature, and you 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 know that, and then you know the climactic em environment of where this animal lives you're going to immediately by just absolute default question what you're doing. And that's mm -hmm. the whole point to what, to the, the manuscript that I put up here, because we should be making these decisions based off of evidence. Uh, we shouldn't necessarily be making them off of, you know, the fact that this is the way we've always done it. Yeah. So, Exactly. So, and of course, the million dollar question with all of this is, does welfare increase? And that's what you, you also covered that in your paper as well. So what are some ways that you measured that as best you could? Because it's another tough thing to measure of, of welfare actually increasing following this framework. Yeah. So welfare was an interesting aspect to this, given that this was a publication coming out of a zoo-based you know, degree program and a zoo-based lab, because the whole point of the people in that lab that I mentioned is to get them into AZA institutions. That's the goal. We have to incorporate welfare and then it's a, her it's a husbandry based thing. So it should be part of it. And with non-emotive animals like snakes, you know, coming up with a mechanism of figuring out if, if they're stressed or not stressed can be rather difficult. And so I had to do a deep dive into that. And it, you know, fortunately while I was developing the protocol, I had a graduate student whose thesis uh, was focused entirely on just answering that question. How do we tell if a snake is stressed or not objectively? So I came up with two mechanisms of doing that. One was to develop something called an ethogram. So basically this involves taking that natural history information and the biology that we know about the behavior of the animal in situ, so in the field, incorporating that, and at the same time, simply watching and observing the animals in human care and looking for a behavior that they're doing in a repetitive manner. Those repetitive behaviors are what we call stereotypies. Now, there is an argument that reptiles are not capable of stereotypies because that's something that you see with, with animals that are perceived to be of a higher cognitive power or ability. I, being the guy who spends a lot of time observing an, uh, reptiles, you know, as part of my job now, can flat out say that they totally are capable of a stereotypy because they're confined in a box. They're not able to do a natural behavior. So they end up doing these repetitive behaviors. So I was looking for those. Um, and then if I saw them via the ethogram, I would basically be able to say, all right, these are the normal behaviors that I see. This behavior is now exponentially more abundant. So since it's more abundant, that could be a typical and then once you identify the behavior, now we have to ask the question, is the animal actually stressed or not? Mm -hmm. And I wanted an objective measure, a, a measure that we could go into and basically say, here's a value, if you will. And we were playing around, and this is what my grad student, Kinsey Scalican, did. She's also my colleague here at the university. Um, is We were looking at this hormone that's associated with stress called corticosterone, mm -hmm. uh, or cor it's cortisol and us, it's corticosterone in reptiles and amphibians. And um, we were trying to come up with a way to measure it. It's a controversial measure of stress with reptiles and amphibians because developing a baseline is difficult. Uh, but what we did with Kinsey is we were able to develop a baseline. So the other thing that we did is once we identified the stereotypy, we pulled the feces from their enclosures and we actually looked for the corticosterone. So it wasn't that I was necessarily saying that snake's dressed. And then someone says, well, why? And then I say, because it is, <laughs> you know, I had 
the ethogram and was able to show this is a new behavior that's popping up and it's being done more so than normal. And then we had the stress hormone values, which were higher when the animal was doing that. So that led me to, to basically come up with this conclusion. The water cobras are a little bit stressed here and I got to come up with a mechanism to fix it. So what was actually happening, kind of putting the cart before the horse here, is I had my large male false water cobra, um, which I have relatively large enclosures for them here. They're actually in my office um, that I'm sitting in right now. Uh, he started to basically frenetically pace his enclosure. And so by knowing about the animal's biology, I knew that in the field, false water cobras are not an ambush type predatory snake. They don't sit in one area all day long. They are active, they're out, and they, they basically are searching their environment for opportunities to feed and opportunities to mate, and then basically looking for different thermal spaces for them. So when he started doing that, I thought, well, he just wants to roam. Like if I can en enable him to do this natural behavior, maybe we can extinguish, extinguish the anatural behavior. So what's kind of funny is if you read in the paper, I talk about how the animals were allowed to roam a like 10 by 15 foot room with uh, a 10 by 15 complex room. Okay. That it's is actually office. my office at <laughs> work and it's relatively complex. So yeah. I simply would open up the glass and would let him roam the room. Um, and I'm of course watching him the entire time. And I would oftentimes put a sign on my door, like for the students not to come barging in. Cause there's a six and a half foot snake in the middle of the floor. <laughs> but what was interesting is by letting them do that, granted, they destroyed my off office in the process, but they would initially frenetically search out the whole room. And then after about an hour and a half, two hours, it would slow down. Uh, and then I would find them, they would sequester themselves off and, you know, hide basically somewhere. And then I would pick them up and put them back in the, into the, uh, the enclosure. Mm -hmm. I then incorporated more natural behavior. I, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a hurt person. What am I going to say? I just put a dead rat on the floor of my office. That's it. <laughs> and then let the animals search around. And then sure enough, you know, he would find the rat rodent and feed in a somewhat natural way. Uh, and uh, sure enough, after allowing him to do this, he stopped the frenetic pacing. And what became really interesting, which isn't in the publication, is he basically was starting to get conditioned where he knew if I was sitting at where I am right now, actually, and he came to the corner of his enclosure and just looked in my general direction, mm -hmm. I, that was, he was almost training me. That meant, all right, open the, the door and let me out. Um, and then I would let him out. And then we've gotten to the point now where – uh, he doesn't do this all the time, but about 50% of the time when he's cruising, he now knows, because I leave his enclosure door open, he basically reaches a point where he's like, all right, I'm done. And then he goes right back into his enclosure, into his own hide box in his enclosure. So I've now incorporated this entire space. I've used natural behaviors based off the literature that I've read. And I can honestly say that I feel like his welfare needs are being met. Uh, but this was all based off of the scientific literature and me trying to think my way through. And if you think about it, you know, that wasn't agonizing for me to do. That was fun. That, that, that took my keeping to another level. Um, and I got to interact with my animal in a way that normally you don't, which is what we all as keepers should be striving to do. Yeah. Yeah. And I have a very similar experience with one of my boas. She'll start to do that every couple of weeks after she's digested and starts to get hungry again or whatever. She'll start pacing. And same thing. I open up the door She'll come out about 10 minutes later. Normally, it takes her a little while to build up the, the courage, I guess. And then she'll scoot <laughs> around the room. And then I'll, she'll go back in or I'll put her back in. And then the pacing will stop. So really, all she needed was that, you know, just to explore a little bit. And yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with Lori Torini's work. Uh, she does lots of training. And, and she says all the time, like, when she walks into her snake room and turns the lights on, all the snakes come up to the glass. They're like, let yes. us out. Like, this is the cue. So they do learn those cues. It's pretty remar remarkable. Oh, no, absolutely. We're, I'm very familiar with Lori. Lori and I are actually working together. My, my graduate Great. student, Michelle and Lori, had a Zoom meeting today, actually. They're doing a, a training thesis with the false water cobra babies. So That is amazing. <clears throat> She's doing such incredible work. And she, she always gets all this flack from people who are, you know, giving her uh, what I was saying last week on an episode is very unsophisticated poor mm -hmm. feedback. And it's like they yes. don't understand how much she's doing with these animals. It's really incredible. So as far as other things, that is there anything that 
you learned about the hydrogenasties that you didn't really know before when you started going through this process? Like, is there any care things or natural history that sort of light bulb moments during this process? Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that I wanted to, that I was really interested in was, uh, breeding false water cobras. Uh, they're a member of a group of snakes that we find throughout South America. And then we have a handful of them here in North America, one of which would be the Western hognose snake, which is ever present in herpetoculture. Uh, and that group of snakes are what are, they used to be in the family Colubridae, but they're now in the family Dipsatidae. They were kind of elevated. And I, I, I learned through this process that Dipsatids are without question, my favorite group of, of snakes. And with dipsatids, their reproductive biology is really intriguing to me as a biologist because uh, most snake species will produce, you know, they'll, they'll ov they, they go through a seasonal reproductive cycle, they ovulate, they drop a clutch of eggs, and then maybe the female will get enough food in her to basically yoke up another clutch of eggs. Uh, and so they might double clutch. Uh, what was intriguing to me is that these dipsatids seem to just lay clutch after clutch after clutch after clutch and i just was trying to get at the why why do they do that uh and then more importantly from a herpetoculture perspective is this bad because uh if, if your goal is just to pump out snakes from an economic perspective of course it's not bad but welfare wise that's incredibly taxing for the girls so i using you know reading about them and trying to like hypothesize on my own what is this okay is this bad uh that was a lot of fun and in reading everything i was i, I kind of come to the conclusion that it, it may not actually be bad for these snakes i'm not saying it's good i'm saying it may not be bad though which is not necessarily the same thing and, and the reason for that is where these animals live the uh, ecological productivity there is is huge. There's all kinds of predators lurking around, far more than we might have here that are going to down a baby snake. And it just kind of makes sense from a biological point of view. If you're going to maintain a population, you can't necessarily rely on a single clutch to do that. So if mm -hmm. the females have the fitness to drop the eggs, it's okay. And I was able to do that, you know, through reading and, and, and all this practice. And one of the crazy things is, I raised two females to um, adulthood using this method. Uh, and it, I wanted to breed them, not just to breed them. That wasn't the goal. We're doing science here. And I knew that I needed baby snakes for a couple graduate student uh, theses. And then I just wanted to have more water cobras around to kind of start anew and test this method out and all that kind of good stuff. And so I bred the initial two females that I had raised who were the same age and they dropped a clutch. And then I didn't reintroduce them to a male because I didn't want to, to push them. And then sure enough, they started getting large again and then boom, they dropped another clutch. So we ended up having way too many water cobras. I think that it ended up being just over a hundred. Uh, wow. But in doing that process, now granted, it was great for science because we need replicate samples and big sample sizes. Um, so, uh, you know, there's that. Uh, and I have sent out many a water cobra to people. In fact, I Lori now has one of our water cobras. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> but, you know, had that happened without me reading all the biology first, I would have been in complete panic mode um, thinking, oh, God, I've really hurt these females by allowing this to happen. Uh, but after, you know, by knowing the biology, knowing that several snakes in this group of snakes do that, I wasn't overly alarmed but then it enabled me to kind of think about this you know test some theories and, and and do some science at the same time so that that was pretty cool and then i made some observations and one of the main things i talk about in this is if you use this approach to your husbandry uh you will invariably prepare your mind my favorite quote in all of science is chance favors the prepared mind which basically means you might see something and not realize you've made a little discovery. And the only way you're going to know that is if you prepare your mind and the way you prepare your mind is you read all this literature. So one of the things that ended up happening is those snakes had young, sorry, they laid the eggs and we were measuring all the babies and we picked, we picked up this little guy and he immediately flopped his head back, stuck out his tongue and rolled on his back. And he was basically doing this thing called thanatosis. He was playing dead. Uh, 
I knew because I had read all the literature on these animals that that behavior had been documented in adults. There was actually a paper on it, but it had not been documented ever in a juvenile or a neonate. So here I am in Northern West Virginia, about as far away from Paraguay as you can get where these things occur naturally. And I've made a little observation. It's not like earth shattering, but it's something new. And so I can take that observation now as a herpetoculturalist and I can write it up and publish it and then help the biology of the animal. And that's exactly what I plan on doing over this break. So, well, and that, and that's, I think one of the coolest parts about going through this framework is those type of discoveries don't have to happen in a scientific lab. As somebody at home with an at home collection, you could actually make a small discovery or, or notice something that many people aren't even aware of that a species does, but the framework has to be there. or You're not going to see it. Yeah, ab absolutely. Great example is what I've already talked about. Um, it's very difficult in nature to find a female snake uh, and, and, you know, find, you, you find her in the field, you can obviously tell she's just laid eggs. But you don't know if that was her first clutch, second clutch, third clutch. When you bring the animals into human care because they're resident with you, you are able to at least answer the question, these animals are capable of producing this many clutches in a year. Granted, it's not in nature, so you can't deduce it to the point where you can say, in nature, they lay three clutches. But you can make a statement, it, you know, in, in a year where they are at the peak of their fitness and be, you know, food is abundant, they have the, the ability to produce X number of clutches. And what's interesting is all that literature I read on false water cobras, nowhere in it did it say that these animals can lay multiple clutches. Um, because of keeping them in human care, uh, we know that. And what was really interesting is when it happened to me, I was like, damn, <laughs> this is this is not good, but it's okay. I immediately went on to the that um, those two Facebook groups, threw up the question: How many of you have had these animals multi clutch? And then the breeders on there were like, Oh yeah, it happens all the time. <laughs> so you know, and, and one of those guys, it, it's almost you know th this is a, a, a thing that happens with frequency uh, with him. And in my case. She only met with the male, both females only were introduced to the males one time. So that was delayed fertilization. That's another aspect of their biology that we, we now know that could be written up is that these animals are capable of producing multiple clutches from a single copulation. We're not going to know that necessarily by observing them in the, in the field, unless you're able to do marker capture studies and actually observe every possible reproductive instance in nature. And the likelihood of that is very low. Right. Yeah, that is very fascinating. There's always this quote that comes to my mind is the the scientists discover what the keepers already kind of know. Like, you know, there's like they'll know on yeah. a periphery, they'll sort of they'll pick up on these things and then science comes by and, and then proves it. And then, yeah, you go to the keepers or the breeders and they're like, oh, yeah, that's we, we've been knowing that for five years. We don't know why, but it's been happening. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that is that's a wonderful place for two camps who mm -hmm. historically may not necessarily get along the greatest, which is the herpetoculture camp and the academic camp to maybe kind of join forces a little bit. Um, we have all these sub, you know, disciplines in herpetoculture, the, you know, the frog people within the frog people, we have the dark frog people, the snake people, turtle people, you know, so on and so forth. And some of those sub disciplines have, are, are definitely better at this than others. One, one, the, the turtle people are, are really kind of figuring out how to merge the private hobby with, the zoo world and the academic universe. I can flat out say as a snake guy, it's damn near non-existent with the snake communities merging with academia. But that doesn't mean it can't happen. It's just people have to let their egos go down and just talk to each other. And the yeah. problem is when, when people are easily offended or won't even entertain a conversation, we're not able to advance forward. And, and one of the other little goals of my manuscript was to basically say, we can do this. Like, this is possible. Uh, and I, I tried to use the water cobras as an example of that. Yeah, I think that's <clears throat> exactly right. Like, we can establish a bridge there. And I think you're right, the turtle people have, you know, they have a very strong conservation side, and they're even in some involved in stud books and whatnot. So there's a hole to be filled there on the snake side, for sure. And one other thing I wanted to ask you about was the, the UVB, because I know you offer the yes. UV. Is that something that was not on the care sheets or care guides? Was that something that uh, you deferred from? Care guides, 
for the most part, said they don't need UVB. Hmm. Um, they either didn't mention it at all, which, you know, to, to devil's advocate, doesn't necessarily mean you're saying they don't need it. It just means you didn't mention it, though yeah. you didn't mention it at the same time. So, you know, there's that. And then there was at least one uh, husbandry report that suggested they don't really need it. Uh, I came to use UVB once again, based entirely off of what I had read about them, because these animals live in an open environment, wetlands, uh, and then, you know, river floodplains, uh, basically semi uh, aquatic grassland type places where there's really not too much canopy and there's open sunshine all day long and they are extremely diurnal. So that kind of made me think, well, it's certainly not going to hurt them. Uh, if I provide it for them, but even then it could be folk could be viewed as folklore husbandry. Me saying, well, they need it. I need to give it to them and see if they use it. And then that's what leads to the evidence-based part of this. And so in my enclosures here in my office, again, uh, the, the top two enclosures in my stack of big six footers, they have UVB lights in them. And then the top one in particular has the holes cut where I have lamps. Mm. And so my gravid females, I, I put them in there. They get the works while they're in their pregnancy. And I had set up a coil bulb that was emitting UVB and then a heat lamp. And what I realized by watching the snake is that my lights would come on in the morning. She would come out of her hide box within 10 minutes of the lights being on. And then she would immediately coil up underneath the UVB light. And then she would not leave that light for like six to eight hours a day. And to be you know, honest, I started asking the question, is, is she only sitting here because this is the end of the viv where she's got enough room? Or is she sitting here because it's actual, the UVB that she's seeking? And it wasn't emitting that much heat. There wasn't a heat panel or anything like that. So I basically swapped the lights. So I put the heat lamp at the end and then the UVB in the middle. And the next morning, lights come on, and she slithers and she went to where the UVB was before. And then she went right to the middle and then she coiled up. And then I proceeded to move lights and basically every time she went to where the UVB was. Mm -hmm. Now, does she need the UVB or does she like the UVB? Those are two you know, different questions. And I, I can't answer that, you know, those questions necessarily. But what I can say from a welfare perspective is it's obviously her choice. This is a choice-driven action. So if she's choosing to be under it, I'm going to make an assumption that it's helping her in some way, or she just it might just might make her feel better, mm -hmm. um, and that's going to lower those corticosterone levels. So it's now my practice with these animals to give them the UVB. Yeah, that makes sense. That is pretty interesting when they when they seek it out. I mean, what's a better example of that of them searching the the UV? So that's pretty cool. <laughs> and then so as far as what do we do with this framework? Because there are people who are listening to this podcast, they will be all over this. They'll go through it. They'll do, they'll do their own, but not everybody's going to do that. So how do you see this progressing? Like if, if you're someone's new to the hobby and they're maybe going to buy a new animal, they're probably not going to go through this. So where do you yeah. see this fitting into the hobby? So I see this fitting into to, to multiple aspects of, of herpetoculture. Uh, outside of the hobby, I could see people who are given entry level zoo jobs and are, are given the task of, all right, you've got to build this enclosure. And they're kind of like, I've never done that before. How do I go about doing this? And I know that from experience because the students that I teach, when I gave them that assignment of, all right, build a vivarium, <laughs> I thought being the herper that I am, this is the best assignment ever. But I have students in there who like birds and mammals and mm. they were kind of like deer in the headlights. Like, what do you want me to do? So, you know, it will help people like that. And it will also help the keeper who maybe is coming to more um, heterogeneity in their keeping or advancement in their keeping. And they're basically trying to go from the minimalistic approach to a more, let's just say naturalistic approach or uh, you know, approach of that nature. And they're basically like, well, where do I start? This could be a potential um, avenue for them, a guidebook, if you will. But I, I go so far in the introduction of the paper to flat out say, take it or leave it. It's up to you as the keeper, whether you use this or not. And if you read the manuscript you know, I, and think, 
well, this is great, but he should have included this, this, and this. Let me know. Mm -hmm. I'm a scientist. That's how science works. Like this is not set in stone. And I also go so far as to say, I'm going to say it on the podcast right now. This is just an idea that's thrown out there. There is absolutely a better way to do it than the way that I proposed. And we won't know that until people use this and we figure out those kinks. Uh, that's going to happen over time. Um, but, but that's what I say to that. And then I would just, I would, I would encourage people that are thinking about maybe trying to justify why they're doing what they're doing. Um, this is a good justification because it outlines how you will increase your odds as a keeper. You will help herpetoculture. You could potentially cross the divide between herpeto herpetoculture and herpetology, you know, all of that, you know, all of the above. Yeah, it's a great self audit for animals that you already have, and and I think that's a great point. Like if if you have a species at home and you go through the framework, write it up and share it with us, share it with the community, and and other people that keep that species can look at it and say, hey, this is what I've noticed, and that way we can start establishing more robust care guides. I hate to use that word because it's far yeah. more than that, but because I, I don't think we can ever get rid of the care sheet at PetSmart, right? Because somebody's going no. in, they want it, they want the five bullet points, tell me how to not make this thing die. But the goal is to hopefully draw those people from that five bullet point to the advancing side. And maybe in a year or two, they start looking into this a little bit more. Yes, absolutely. And, and I'm not expecting, you know, the, the average family that's getting their first crested gecko <laughs> to the, go on the Google scholar and start doing <laughs> yeah. an academic search of everything. Yeah. You know, that's where the care guide kind of comes into a, a effect. But I can say from firsthand experience that a lot of times what will happen is people will get that crested gecko. They bring it home. They follow that initial, you know, suggestion of care. They'll start to notice that their animal isn't necessarily th thriving or doing well. And then they start to question it. And when mm -hmm. they start to question it, that's where something like this could maybe, you know, sneak in. And most of the people listening to this podcast are probably intermediate to advanced keepers. And, and those are the people that might want, you know, to, to maybe try doing something differently. Uh, and, and this is a way to go about doing that. And if you do it this way, by sheer default, you will learn so much about the biology of your animal that you're going to end up having a brand new appreciation you didn't have before. I've always kept animals based off like their natural history and biology is what drove me to want to keep them. Mm -hmm. And it's been kind of an interesting uh, avenue for me teaching these courses and interacting with students and realizing that there's plenty of people that like snakes and they go out and they get something like a ball python and they don't even know that the ball python is native to us. I almost said Australia <laughs> native to Africa um, and where it lives in Africa and what it does in Africa, you know, and, and when you realize that and you start to like, dive into its biology they just become so much cooler uh, and it's really hard just to throw this in there if you really understand the biology of an animal to keep it minimalistically because you then know by sheer default i am not providing the microhabitats and all the ecological theaters that this animal may live in now you're not providing that either by keeping it in a box uh, but you can get a hell of a lot closer if you understand the biology of the animal and let that drive your keeping. That is so true. And it, I think you hit the nail on the head. The appreciation of the animal just grows exponentially when you start understanding, not only when you start understanding the behavior, but when you actually start seeing it. And, mm -hmm. you, you know, I always, I was thinking about this the other day, like, what would you rather do? Look at photos of an animal or watch planet earth, right? You want to yeah, see the exactly. animal move and interact with its in environment and, I don't think it would be possible for a keeper to make a an enclosure that you know allows the animal to act naturally, and then for them to revert back to something that's minimalistic. Like you could, it would just yes. break your heart to do that. And I, mm -hmm. I think if we had people just testing that out, okay, let's see what happens when you add you know climbing space for a carpet python. How could you go back to a drawer? It would just not be possible. Yes, mm -hmm. and you get to see behaviors. A, a great you mentioned carpet python, so. Um, here in the office, they're not in the office currently, they've gone into bromation, but I keep, uh, in the office with me, uh, two pairs of, um, Erian giant or poplin carpet python. And I have them in some, I wouldn't necessarily say they're fully decked out naturalistically, but they absolutely have a substrate bedding hides. And then I have a, a series of branches in the enclosure shaped like an X that enable them to kind of go up and, and, and perch. And I was reading uh, 
Nick Mutton and company's book, The Complete Carpet Python, and it talked about the hunting posture that carpets will take up where they basically coil up on a branch and then they do the S neck curve and stare at the ground waiting for something to come by. And I, I remember coming into my office the day or, or two after I'd read that and I looked in the cage and three of the four of them were in that posture. Mm -hmm. And up until I had read that, I, I just thought, okay, they're up in the branches. I didn't, you know, I didn't really put it all together and realize I'm at least providing them a level of care where they feel, okay, if I go into this posture, there's a possibility of prey coming by. And then knowing they're not just coiled up on a branch, this is a legitimate behavior they're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, it just doesn't get any better than that. Like I, I was completely geeking out. And now I might be having the worst day ever, but if I glance over and see one of them doing that, I, I you know, it's just cool. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's it, just part of it. Cool is a great, it's just a simple way to say it. It, it is just mm -hmm. cool. And, and it does make you feel slightly accomplished as the keeper. Yes. I think there is an inherent guilt about keeping the animals in captivity. Like you have removed their freedom and to at least allow them to, you know, create an enclosure that allows them to exhibit those behaviors does make you feel good. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Zach, this was a great conversation. I, I really, this, I love this framework. I think this is excellent. I think this is something that we can, like you said, it's just a starting, this is the first step and we can start to bridge these gaps between science and the hobby. And that's exactly what we need to do to continue making sure this stays healthy, our hobby stays healthy and also, you know, yes. legal as well, which is a big, <laughs> exactly. a, a big thing. Is there anything else that we, we didn't cover that you definitely wanted to say before, before we jumped off? Uh, the only thing that I would like to say is what I say whenever I'm on a podcast like this is that. I'm in the business of teaching people and I'm in the business of pe giving people degrees. So if you're listening to this and, and you're, you're thinking, man, that's something I would like to do you know, for an undergraduate degree, think about what's Liberty with our ZUSI major. But then those of you who already have degrees and are looking for a master's degree, I now have this herpetoculture lab. Uh, and I am always looking for people that want to take things like this evidence-based husbandry framework that I've proposed uh, or, test various aspects of keeping i'm always looking for them to join the lab and that degree is actually an online degree so you can pretty much do it anywhere on the planet so that just means you got to contact me and you can contact me through you know find me on facebook and just message me it seems weird for a professor to say contact me that way but it <laughs> works um i'm on instagram zach loafman and then you can also if you really feel the need to do it email me at uh, zloafman at westliberty.edu but we're, we're taking students now. And if it's in the future, you're listening to this later on, we'll be taking grad students then too. So Awesome. Well, I'll make sure everything's in the show notes and as well as links to the paper so people can give that a read and uh, all your contact information will be there as well. So first off, thank you for doing the work on this paper. I think this is a great start. Like we said, this will be a, a fantastic frame for, framework for people to use. And thank you for spending an hour and a half here with me today. I really appreciate it. I know. Thank you so much for the opportunity and keep doing wonderful things with this podcast. I absolutely love it. Thank you very much. All right. That is the end of that episode. Zach, thank you so much for jumping on an episode and laying out your whole framework for us. I'm very excited to see how this progresses over time. I know the listeners are going to jump all over this as well as anybody who is just involved in advancing herpetoculture. They're just, this is a great framework to have us moving forward in the right direction. So thank you so much for doing the work and joining me on the show. Listeners, as always, thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. If you do want to help support the show, remember you can give a rating on the Apple Podcasting app or just share the content on social media anywhere. Make sure you tag me so I can thank you. Again, I do answer my DMs. I Even if I'm a little bit slow, I will get to every DM. So if you do send me a DM and you just want to say hi, uh, you can talk to me there. If you are looking for more information on this episode of the podcast or any other episode of the podcast, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. There I'll have links to everything, including the paper that Zach was talking about today. Thank you very much to customreptilehabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. If you are looking for any reptile-related equipment, make sure you check out the show notes or the YouTube description box for the affiliate link to that website. All right, we did it. That is the end of the last episode of 2020. Thank you so much for sticking with me this whole year. As weird and as crazy as this year was, it was also a great year for the podcast. We added Bryce's show, Animals Everywhere, which we're going to fire back up in January as well. Of course, we added row sessions and round tables too. So thank you so much for sticking with us and supporting the show and being part of the conversation in the comments and sharing and everything you guys are doing is just fantastic. Have a great new year and I will see you guys in 2021.